Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Stoanova Conversations. My name is Massimo Pilucci, and I'm a professor of philosophy at the City College of New York. And my co-host is uh, Rob Coulter, University of Wyoming, also a professor of philosophy. Uh, the way this is going to work is that the two of us are going to have a chat on the topic of the day, which I'm going to introduce in a minute. And then the last 20 minutes or so, we will have a QA. and uh, So if you're interested in uh, uh, asking a question or making a comment, just raise your virtual hand uh, and we'll call on you in order of appearance. Let me announce uh, also before we get to today's topic, the next episode of the Store Nova Conversations, which will take place on Sunday, October 25th at 1 p.m. Eastern. Our guest will be William Stevens for a discussion about Marcus Aurelius. William authored a book, among other things, uh, called entitled Marcus Aurelius, A Guide for the Perplexed, which I highly recommend if you're interested in understanding Marcus' philosophy. If you want to register for that event, go to meetup.com and look for Stoa Nova. And if you wish to watch past episodes of the Stoa Nova Conversations, then go to Vimeo and search for the Stoa Nova channel. So today we're going to talk about something called A Field Guide to a Happy Life, which just happens to be the latest book that I published uh, just like a week ago or so. And so we're going to do things in a, by switching roles in an unusual way. I'm going to be the guest. Rob is actually going to be the host and he's going to be grilling me about the book. Hi, Rob. Hi, Massimo. Glad to be here today. Glad to see everybody. Like, uh, so I'm Rob. For those of you who don't know, I see a few familiar faces, so that's great. Um, yeah, when uh, Massimo and I discussed talking about his new book, A Field Guide to the Happy Life, um, I said to him, I, I quoted Aristotle, and I said uh, that while our friends are dear, we must value the truth above even them. And uh, <laughs> so given that... He was uh, talking about Plato, so that's a pretty good compliment. <laughs> <laughs> right, no, right. And uh, um, so I, I am going to offer a couple of what we might call challenges uh, to some things that Massimo argues in this new book. And um, if you haven't read it yet, I think it's very stimulating. Uh, I'm, um, it made me think a lot about Epictetus and Stoicism. And uh, quite frankly, I can't think of a higher compliment from a philosopher. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> so, <laughs> Thank you. Um, yeah, so I'm just going to raise a few questions and challenges and we'll see how much, how time goes. Uh, and I want to make sure that other people get a chance too. So I'll try to shut up uh, before I believe, I believe Massimo and I could talk about this for probably days on end. Yes. Um, <laughs> So uh, we did so to... actually <laughs> in, 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 when you went in Rome That's for right. the story school. We literally right. did talk about these for, for days on end. Yeah. So maybe when when and if we get the chance to uh, do something like that again, we'll we'll do so. Absolutely. Um, so the first thing I wanted to talk about, and and um, I don't think this is a big shock to anybody who's um, paid attention to your work on on Stoicism, is that I'd like to talk a bit about the notion of providence. Sure. in Epictetus and in Stoicism more generally. And uh, it's not clear to me from what you say in uh, Field Guide to the Happy Life uh, exactly what you take to be Epictetus's conception of providence. And, and why I think that might matter is the following, right? Uh, there are a number of older texts, older than Epictetus, right? Cicero comes to mind, for example, as well as... Um, um, some other texts that source uh, earlier Stoics, such as Chrysippus, that suggest that providence really is just fate, which is really just uh, a sequence of causes, is uh, a term that, that uh, Cicero uses, right? Yeah. Uh, and if that's the case, that seems to indicate that providence is simply that sequence of causes. It's just the causal order of the universe. Right. Okay? Um, now, if that's all that's meant by providence, in these ancient texts, um, in, in these earlier texts and so on, either it seems to me, maybe we're reading more into Epictetus than if he adheres to this view, than is really there. Uh, or you think that there's something that Epictetus is committed to that's, that goes above and beyond the idea of providence from the early Stoics. And if that's the case, I don't know what that is, but if the first is the case, uh, then, then I'm not sure your your objections or your disagreements with Epictetus are really disagreements with, uh, with uh, the Stoic view of Epictetus. Does that question make sense to you? It makes perfect sense. Okay. So yes, and 
I think that the Stoics meant more than just uh, you know, the universal cause of, of, of uh, web of cause and effect when they talked about providence. They certainly did mean that too, no, no question about it. And so that one of the moves that a lot of a good number of modern Stoics have been making basically is to concentrate on that part, on that aspect, you know, when they talk about uh, fate being essentially the, the cause and effect everywhere, the laws of nature, you know, as we will call them today. And so focus on that. And, and that's fine. If you, if you, you're absolutely right that if you just focus on that bit, then there is no problem with the ancient Stoic view of metaphysics. There is no problem in terms of modern science. Uh, and therefore, there is also no consequence in terms of the ethics, because as I'm sure we're going to talk about in a minute, uh, it's not just the metaphysics that's important here. In fact, it's, it's, it's right. the ethics, right? However, it, then when I, so initially when I started, when I got into Stoicism, that's the, the message that I got from a lot of the Stoic popularizers, right? So it's like, oh yeah, okay, then it's not a problem. I'm a scientist, I can, I, I certainly can rally behind the idea of fate understood as weapon uh, of cause and effect, not a problem. And then I started reading the actual, you know, texts. <laughs> it's like, oh, wait a minute, <laughs> hold on here. First of all, for instance, in the discourses, and I, I, I apologize uh, to you, I should have actually um, looked, down, uh, looked up the specific reference, but I will give it to you after the show. <laughs> uh, in the discourses, Epictetus actually spends a section talking about the nature of God. Mm -hmm. And for all effective purposes, he deploys an argument from design. Uh, what we would today call an argument from design. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, in fact, he says things like, you know, the, the, the universe works, uh, looks to me like a, a sword that fits the scabbard, right? Yep. So this is a classic sort of argument from design. That already at that point, that seems to me to go beyond just the notion of cause and effect, because it hints very strongly at an intelligence in op operating behind, behind the whole thing. Can I in yeah, of course pause can. right there? Yeah. Um, how does it hint strongly at an intelligence? It seems like going to an intelligence from the claim that things like the sword that fits the scabbard, which I think is really kind of more of a biological metaphor um, hmm. uh, in this case. Um, isn't it the question of whether there's an intelligent designer, an inference from observations like that, rather than a presupposition of it? Uh, it is an inference, and but if you again, if you read that bit in the discourses, Epictetus comes really close to that difference. It, he doesn't make it explicitly. Okay. So if there were only that, then I was like, okay, mm, um, maybe mean, he meant that, maybe it didn't. But okay. there is more. Now there is, as you know, there is reason to believe that Epictetus, despite the fact that he actually made a number of innovations in in his version of you know, Stoic philosophy, for instance his view um, of, uh, he articulates a view of uh, role ethics that is novel. It's, it's different and, and more sophisticated than the previous one, which was due, was due to Panicius, one of the middle Stoics. Uh, so he does a number of things. He introduces the three disciplines of, you know, desire and aversion, action, and, uh, and assent, which is not found in earlier Stoicism. But, it, but for other, in other respects, in many other respects, uh, the impression that modern scholars have of Epictetus is that he was actually a fairly traditional Stoic. He went back to right. Chrysippus. Right. Um, you know, even, these, even the famous dichotomy of control, you know, some things are up to us and other things are not up to us. It's true that he did put it at the centerpiece, as the centerpiece of his philosophy. But that one is found all the way back to the, uh, to the early Stoics. So, so piece of evidence, inconclusive evidence, number one is he uses an argument from design. Uh, which in my mind as a modern scientist goes a little beyond the simple observation that things are complex and they, you know, and that there is some order in nature. Then we know that he, uh, for other, for most other, in most other respects, Epictetus followed the ancient Stoics. Now, what did the ancient Stoics did? Well, I'm going to put, put forth two sources of evidence. In the, I believe it's the second book of Cicero's uh, On the Nature of the Gods, there is a long discussion of what the Stoics think about God. And there, I think it's pretty explicit that they're thinking of it as a living organism endowed with reason. Um, not only Cicero mentions that all three of the, of the early, um, you know, um, chiefs of the Stoa, as we might call them. <laughs> so Zeno, the founder, 
Cleantes and Chrysippus, all three of them actually use the argument for this, from design all, in, in all three cases. And there are fragments that actually testify to all these things. And you know, we have to remember that Cicero, uh, like him, actually had access to the original texts. Right? He, he had read right. stuff right. that we don't sure. know an, anymore. Uh, and that's why he's one of the major sources that we have today about, about this. But um, Cleantes in particular also um, brings up a number of other arguments and in fact Zeno as well some of which are pretty silly um, from a modern perspective like you know for instance he says well so many people believe that there is a god so there must be a god it's like wait what wait a minute <laughs> that's uh that's a fairly obvious logical fallacy but nevertheless he insists that there are there is such a thing and the way he describes the, uh, uh, the god it really does seem to go very very clearly beyond the notion of cause and effect and Zeno um, proposes the following argument. He says, well, of course the universe is endowed with reason and is living because there are inside the universe living beings that are, that are endowed with reason. Now, is, uh, the way he puts it, he's trying to derive a systemic property from the properties of elements in, within that system. As we know, that's a logical fallacy, actually. Uh, you know, it's a fallacy of composition. You cannot do that. Uh, it, you can't go either way. It's, not, it's simply not the case. It doesn't follow that because a system has certain property, each individual member of that system has those properties. For instance, a bucket of water is wet at normal temperature and pressure, but each individual molecule of water is not wet. And vice versa, you cannot go from properties of individual components to the properties of the whole. You cannot say that because the universe contains living organism capable of reason, therefore the universe itself is a living organism capable of reason. Unless you mean this in the most trivial way, that is like, well, there is, you, there is intelligence in the universe, so fine. But that's a little, that's a little too trivial. Finally, last, last bit of evidence. I actually went back and checked uh, a couple of chapters by, um, that, that appear in the Cambridge Companion to the Stoics, which I think is, is one of the best sources, scholarly sources for introduction to, to all, all general aspects of Stoic philosophy. So let me read you a couple of quotes. This is Michael White from chapter five of the Cambridge Companion. That's, that's a chapter on Stoic natural philosophy. He says, the Stoics followed the precedent of, they were not original in this particular respect because they followed the precedent of various pre-Socratics and of Plato in holding that the whole cosmos is a living being or animal, zoyon, and sold and rational, having as its ruling principle, hegemonicon, ether, typically equated with fire by the Stoics. According to Chrysippus and Posidonius, reason, nous, extends to every part of it, just as soul does with respect to us. And then there is two quotes. Uh, of course, Michael mentions the original source for this, which is mostly Dodgers, Laertius, Volume 7. And then there are two uh, quotes by Keimpe Algra. Uh, that's the chapter on uh, uh, Stoic theology in the Cambridge Companion. And uh, Algra says, the existence of God involves the fact that he governs or rather is the cosmos, which explains why some of the proofs of the existence of God simply amount to proofs that the cosmos itself is a rational, ordered living being. And then Algar goes on. According to a famous common Stoic description of God, again, mentioned in Diogenes Laertius, God is an immortal living being, rational, perfect, and thinking in happiness, unreceptive of anything bad and provident with regard to the cosmos and the things therein. Mm -hmm. But he is not of human form. He is the demiurge of the whole, and as it were, the father of all things, both in general and insofar as the part of him is concerned, which pervades all things, and which is called by many names, corresponding to its powers. So <laughs> if you look at that stuff, then it seems to me that the, the Stoics really did believe that the, the universe or God is certainly the locus of cause and effect. It's certainly the locus of, of, of you know, the, the laws of nature, but it also is conceived as a living organism endowed with locus. And that to me is the bit that is not acceptable in modern terms, um, because of course, as a biologist and a philosopher of science, I'll say, no, the universe is a set of dynamic processes that has no uh, ensouled anything. Well, yeah, go well, for it. But, but logos doesn't entail ensouled in the same way that we are, mm -hmm. for example, right? So, so 
So, okay. So I don't, I don't want to get too deep in the weeds on this, but <laughs> sure. I, I see that I, I triggered you to dive in. Uh, <laughs> so, so good. Um, but I, I, I'm not sure that you've, uh, uh, so I'm, so I'm totally on board with everything you said. Um, one thing I would emphasize that Algra, for example, uh, is that the divine providence is identical to the universe, not something separate right. from. No, that's right. That's correct. Yes. Yeah. So, right. um, but I'm wondering, so let's get to the ethics point. Right? Yes, exactly. Because that's okay. what really matters, right? That's right. Right. Oh, so, at the very least, however, before we get to the ethics, at the very sure. least, I think the quotes that then, you know, the reference that I gave you, I think establish the following, that at a minimum, there is reasonable disagreement about what the Stoics actually meant by Logos, the universe and God. And that a reasonable understanding, which is not just mine, it's, you know, just what a couple of scholars is that what they meant was actually, in fact, a living organism. Um, as, just as Judge Laertius explicitly says, he does mm -hmm. say the universe is a living organism. And that's the bit that I, that I reject. But yes, let's get to the ethics. Okay, yeah, good. Um, so what I'm thinking about um, here is, is the famous, um, well, so uh, section three, mm -hmm. right? So that's the bit that famously in the original is uh, it talks about, well, I'm fond of a jug, right? Uh, but I should understand the nature of the jug. And if it breaks, I won't be, um, I won't be upset about that. And then transfers it to, um, transfers it to, you know, if your wife or your child dies, then you won't be disturbed or upset. Right. And uh, as uh, you know, we've, we've talked about, and as, as everybody knows, that's a, that's, people react rather um, that that bothers people. Yes, I'd say. Right. That, that Critics of stoicism to... usually pick on that and similar quotes in Epictetus. Right. Say, These people are callous bastards. You right. know, don't listen to them. That's They're right. So, but I take it that your way to sort of soften the blow of that sort of idea, if I can put it that way, is um, by... Uh, taking down the idea of providence, meaning I think it, so if I understand you right, Epictetus's move here is we won't be disturbed by the loss of our wife and child because we think that the universe is provident. Right. Okay. Well, if, if, what does provident mean there? Um, Good question. Right. Uh, so I'm not sure what you, what we just discussed gives us an answer that's satisfactory for something like in Corinthians three as your objection, right? So the objection has to be that there's, so even if it is, even if it is a living organism endowed with logos, that still doesn't get us the sort of um, consolation that you object to in mm. creating three. Mm. Yeah. I, so I think it does, but we need to be careful about you're absolutely right. Uh, we need to be careful about what providence means here. And I can tell you what I think it means. And I can tell you what I think it doesn't mean. The thing that it doesn't mean is providence in anything like the Christian sense. So we're not talking about, so Epic, when Epictetus says you should be not only, uh, you know, um, accepting your fate, essentially, might embrace it, right? I mean, that's the, that's the move that I'm objected to, objecting to, uh, what Nietzsche much later on called amor fati, right? For sure. But loving your fate. And it's clear in Epictetus that he says you should do that. In fact, Marcus Aurelius also uh, says it very explicitly. It's like, it's not, a it's not just acceptance, it's really embracing. Now, that embracing does not come from a Christian-like concept of providence. Because in the case of the Christians, there is you know, a God that has created the universe and he really cares about each one of us. He loves us individually and he has a plan. We don't know what the plan is, uh, but there is one. And therefore, if something shitty happens to you, you should be happy about it, not just enduring it, because you know, it's, it's, it, God knows what he's doing. Right? And who the hell are you to, to question God? <laughs> Things will be clear to you when you get to the, the afterlife. That is absolutely not what Epictetus is saying. Right? He's not getting there. And in fact, I, one of the authors that I, that I mentioned here says explicitly the, uh, the, that the, the universe is not, that, that God, the God of the Stoics is not um, you know, 
preparing things, doesn't have a plan about things. And it's not, it's not, it's in fact, he's not interested actually in human beings. However, there is an interesting, and I think beautiful, by the way, if I, if I only could believe it, I would be very happy. Um, I think that there is a beautiful and much more interesting sense of providence that the ancient Stoics had. And this comes through very, uh, very clearly in when Epictetus uses the analogy of the foot stepping into the mud, right? Mm -hmm. But I would, um, uh, and so let me talk about the analogy for a minute and then I'll tell you how actually I see it from a modern perspective works even better uh, from a modern perspective. So um, if, you, if you buy into the, that conception of the cosmos. So what Epictetus says is like, look, you're just like a foot that steps into the mud. Of course, if you just consider yourself as a foot, you're going to say, what the hell? I'm not going to want to stop step into the mud. That's disgusting. You know, why, why would I do that? But if you realize you're connected to a body, right? you're just a, an organ within a body, and the body has to step into the a, a muddy path in order to get home, then you're going to be happy. You're going to be happy not because the body cares about you. That would be the Christian version of things. But because you're doing your duty as part of the body. The, you know, you're a foot. What, what is you supposed to do? You have to walk. And if it turns out that you're walking in the mud, well, that's, that's part of it. And so you should embrace it. In modern terms, one could come up with an even better analogy that was not accessible to Epictetus. I think that the ancient Stoics thought of the, organ, of the, the cosmos as a living organism with a body, you know, some, some kind of analogous to a body, not literally with a body, but analogous to a body. And I, we, we are the individual cells of that organism. And those individual cells have a duty to perform, right? So there are the neural cells, there are the blood cells, there are the skin cells, and so on and so forth. And each one of us does its own thing, even though, of course, we don't understand what the hell we're doing because we don't have the full view of the body, just like an individual cell on my skin does not have the full view of what's happening. In the, I don't care about individual cells of, you know, of my skin, um, they're there to serve me, not the other way around. So I'm not provident in that sense. Um, and the individual cells may actually, at some point, actually have to die in order for, to do their, their job. So I think of that as the ancient Stoic view. And that would justify embracing your fate. Again, not because the universe, God loves you, but because you are doing your duty. You're doing what you were created for. You're, you're doing exactly, you're, exp, you're exp, uh, carrying out your function, function within the universe. So you know, what else would you want to have as a, you know, as a reason to embrace and be happy about, about your fate? Problem, of course, is that I think the analogy fails in terms of modern science, that there is, that is uh, you and I are not actually doing anything for the universe. We're not, we're not cogs in a machine that unless we work in a certain way, the whole thing is going to grind to a halt. We are simply, uh, you know, the result of chance and necessity, as the, as the a famous French biologist put it back in the 70s, uh, Jacques Monod. Uh, that is, we are the result of, of the workings of, the, of, of uh, the laws of nature, that's necessity, and chance. Uh, you know, it could have been uh, just as easily that uh, I had grown up in Wyoming, uh, or you grown up in Rome, or you know whatever whatever <laughs> it is, and so we're just there for for random accidents of the universe. There is really no rhyme or reason, basically, to what's going on, other than uh, that yes, there is there are laws of nature and there is universal cause and effect, right? So what I'm su suggesting is that if you drop that analogy that Epictetus uses very nicely, because you don't buy into these relation between the parts and the whole, then, then you cannot afford to have amor fati. You, you cannot because, you know, it doesn't make any sense for me to say, uh, so I, I don't criticize, unlike modern critics, critics of Stoicism, Stoicism I, not only I don't criticize Epictetus for saying things like, hey, you remember, your child is mortal, and if he dies, try not to be disturbed. Because from his perspective, that makes perfect sense. He's not being callous at all, uh, right? It, it makes perfect sense from, his, from the perspective of how we saw the world. The problem is it doesn't make sense for me as a modern biologist, you know, scientist and, and philosopher. Therefore, if my child should die, I cannot say, oh, well, let me not be disturbed by this thing because, you know, the, the foot had to, to cross the mud. The, the mud. I would have to, I, I would be disturbed, but I would hope my stoic training, my stoic philosophy would allow me 
to accept what happened and to move on. So that's the difference. All right. Well, so I don't buy it. Okay. Um, <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> um, and, and let me just briefly say why. Um, and then we'll, we'll maybe move on to something else. Uh, yeah. <laughs> um, I don't think you need any of that for Enchiridion 3. I, don't, I, um, I think all Enchiridion 3 is saying is that we won't, with your stoic training, he doesn't say that you won't feel anything. Mm -hmm. He says that you won't be what's often translated as disturbed or perhaps more strongly disordered. Right. Right. If I understand the universe and that people die, even my wife or my child, right, then Enchiridion 3 isn't telling me to embrace that. Mm. It's saying I should be able to approach that in a way where I'm not just knocked completely off kilter. Yeah. Which is, I think, a much weaker thing than it sounds like you're attributing to Epictetus to make that move. And so I, so, even if we agreed about all the other stuff, I'm not sure that that addresses Enchiridion 3 in, in the same way. Uh, you may be correct about Enchiridion 3, but if you actually read the entire corpus of... Well, we could look Epictetus, at other stuff. Right, Epictetus yeah, yeah. and Marcus, who is influenced by it. I think that you will, at, in some passages, you, you do get this notion of you should be really happy about it um, and not, not just accept it but okay well that's I a think longer we, conversation yeah that's right i, I think we we covered that point so what, what else you got <laughs> well i was just uh sort of a related thing one last related small thing sure. i think and this is kind of a question about understanding uh words one of your themes right and and so you've very helpfully i think uh broken up your objections to Epictetus, uh into into themes uh, which, and, and Providence shows up in four of them, I believe, if I remember yeah. right. Um, but this is one that's not about that. So um, one of the themes is that externals are not to be despised, right? So, right, um, yeah. in, there's a number of examples where the word despise pops up in, the, in many translations of the Enchiridion that, you know, like the banquet passage, Right. Right. That, that uh, if we, you know, when the banquet comes by, when they pass, I always think of Thanksgiving dinner, at big family dinners, right? So when the, when the stuffing comes by, you don't grab at it greedily. You just take what's there and so on. And then at the end, he says, and if you're really like, you know, if you're close to a sage, you will despise them. And a lot of people read despise as something like you will hate them. Mm -hmm. Right or strongly dislike or something like that. But that seems to me to be an overreading of uh, despise there. When, you know, despise etymologically comes from Latin, despicere, right? Which means to look down upon. And one English understanding is to think that it's not worth noticing. Mm -hmm. Right. And I think if we understand despise or translated it differently to just say that Externals are not to be hated, and I think you're right if that's what it means. That can't be what Epictetus means um, for a variety of reasons. But uh, if we take despise in those passages to simply mean not really worth my attention, do you have the same sort of objection if that's the case? I still would. Uh, again, I'm, of course, I'm, I'm going to uh, disagree on the, on the interpretation. I think that reading the Stoic corpus, not just Epictetus, but also Seneca uses a lot the word despite, for instance. Um, I do think, especially in Epictetus, there is a sense of, you know, Epictetus was well known for being closer to the cynic end of the, of the Stoic spectrum. So I think there is a little bit of cynicism in, in Epictetus. Uh, for instance, when he has an entire chapter there where he tells his students, like, you know, the cynics are really where we should be at, but you guys are not good enough for that. And so it's like... <laughs> So it, I think it's pretty, it's arguable at least, uh, you know, that, that Epictetus means something a little stronger than what you're suggesting. But even if he does say, uh, you know, mean what, what, you, what you mean, um, that's still a, a, unnecessary, I think, in terms of especially modern stoicism. 
Why is that? Well, because in this sense, uh, it's kind of interestingly, I go back to Socrates himself. Right? Socrates didn't, didn't despise anything in terms of externals. Um, but what he said was that, that the relationship between externals or what the Stoics later called indifference, right? And virtue is that, or, or wisdom, is that virtue is precisely what allows you to use the externals correctly, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. So, but if you want to use the externals correctly, so externals, of course, are things like including your health. That's an external as much as it sounds counterintuitive because it's about my body, but it is external. Uh, it's external to my faculty of, of reasoning. That's, that's essentially what Epictetus means. For Epictetus, we are just the proheresis. We are, we are the faculty of judgment. That's it. Everything, everything outside that, it's external, including our own body, right? But body, reputation, uh, you know, wealth, education, all that sort of stuff. Uh, according to Socrates and the Stoics go with, with along with that, uh, all of those things are made valuable or non-valuable, preferred or dispreferred, selectable or not selectable, you know, that whatever word you want to use because of your wisdom, because of your virtue, because of your faculty of judgment, uh, however you want to put it, right? Well, but if that's the case, then it seems to me to follow that the so-called indifferent are not, are not something that I can just let, you know, take or, or let go, it doesn't matter. It does matter because that's the way, those are the tools through which I can actually live a life that is worth living, a eudaimonic life. Um, if, I, if I am a cosmopolitan, like the Stoics are, then it follows that it's very useful to me to be educated, perhaps even to be wealthy, certainly to be healthy, and so on and so forth. And of course, to use those things in order to help fellow members of the human cosmopolis. So in what sense are those things therefore not important? They, they actually are. They are still indifferent in the technical sense that they don't make me a better person or a worse person. In fact, it's the other way around. I make them useful or not useful depending on how I do things. Does that make sense? Well, I'd still want to say that then on, taken on their own, mm-hmm. they aren't worth my paying attention to. Right, they're only worth paying attention to when they're combined with my virtue, absolutely, or or, yes. or vice. Yes. Right. So I don't think that says anything about the status of the externals or not. Yes. But it, yeah. Yeah. No. Go ahead. No. That's that's correct. I mean, if you if you put it if you put it that way, that that's correct. But that isn't the the uh, feeling that I get from reading Epictetus. Uh, sometimes he really does talk about no, you should really focus just on your priorities, just on your faculty judgment. Well, yes, I should. Absolutely. <laughs> but why? Um, it's, it, I should do that. Of course. So I, part of the reason I put that thing in the, in the field guide, that section in the field guide, is because I actually see a lot of modern Stoics or modern Stoic yeah, yeah. going in that direction and say, oh, no, 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 I'm, I shouldn't be concerned myself with externals at all. I should be just focusing on my virtues. Right. Like, well, what are you focusing on your virtue for? Um, that's so that you can use externals to make this a better world right. for everybody, right? So that's right. what that's coming from. Yeah, I get, I, I, I get that as, as a response to a way of understanding Epictetus right. that's, that's flawed. Um, but I'm, yeah. So yeah. Uh, we could continue this absolutely <laughs> for a long, long time. Right. And I want to make sure to give other people a chance to ask some questions. And, and I think you have need... one more uh do you really we, want to have time? I think we should, uh, we should discuss that last issue that you mentioned to me. Okay. Um, and, then, and then we'll open up to discussion. We have a couple of people lined up. All right. So the last issue is, is one that I wouldn't consider an objection mm-hmm. uh, per se, although right, how we answered it could be the grounds for such a thing. And that is um, how much updating of a, sort of a school of thought can we do before it becomes unrecognizable as that school of thought, right? right. So, I mean, you know, Somewhere between me sitting right here and my matter becoming a doorknob, yeah. I'm no longer me, right? right. And uh, so the question, of course, is relevant to Stoicism, is how much do we have to hold on to to still be a Stoic okay. or to still be Stoicism? Okay. And, in, you know, and I'm thinking, of course, in other cases like uh, on, it seems to me a spectrum kind of possibility, right? On the one hand, it seems like one's a Platonist these days, if you uh, countenance the existence of any abstract objects whatsoever. Right. On the other end, 
right? Perhaps something you might see in very sort of orthodox understandings of certain religions, right? You have to believe every proposition of this thing to count as one of them. Right. Um, so I wondered if you had any thoughts on how much is too much uh, as far as updating Stoicism? At what point might it become something not really Stoicism? Yeah, that's a great question. And uh, I'm going to answer it in two ways. I mean, to, on the one hand, of course, as you point out, this is a continuum. This is, so, so it's very possible that there isn't going to be a sharp demarcation line there. Um, that at some point it becomes questionable. It's like somebody might say, no, that's no longer. In fact, we're already there. Um, there are a group of people that refer to themselves as traditional Stoics. Uh, Chris Fisher is uh, the one that, that comes to mind. Um, he's the most active in that group. And he basically says, if you reject the notion of, of Stoic providence, then you're not a Stoic. If you're not a pantheist, you're not a Stoic. Now, I disagree with him, um, and, and I told him a couple of times <laughs> in no uncertain terms that I disagree. I, I think that's far too restrictive, far too conservative a conception of Stoicism. But never, ne nevertheless, your, your question is perfectly val uh, valid because you know, at some point, if you start dropping a bunch of stuff or reimagining re a bunch of stuff uh, too much, then, then you're only inspired by the Stoic tradition, but you're really not a Stoic anymore. So I can give you my take on where that, where I would draw that line. And of course, people, different people will draw the line differently. As I said, Chris Fisher draws it much more, much earlier than I did, than I do. I would say that uh, in order to be a Stoic, you still, so actually, let me back up for a second here. Um, I think of philosophies of life, but in fact, of any complex account of anything, including scientific theories, the way in which uh, Imre Lakatos, uh, one of the students of Popper, thought about it. He thought he was talking about scientific the theories, but, th but then he expanded that actually also to mathematics. And I think it can be expanded to philosophy. He, he said, look, there is, there is a core that a core set of notions. And if you do away with any of the core set of notions, you're not talking about the same theory anymore. You're not talking about the same account. And then there is a pro what he called the protective belt. Protective belt are things that are logically connected with the core, but they are dispensable. They are revisable. They are, they are things that you can negotiate depending on, on external circumstances, depending on facts, depending on objections and so on and so forth, right? Um, so the question, in other words, in, to put it in, in Lakatos, terms is, well, where is this, the core of Stoicism and what, what belongs to the core and what belongs to the, uh, to the protective belt. I think the core is made at least of the following. Uh, number one, virtue is the only intrinsic good or the chief good or however you want to put it, right? And the reason for that is because that is what, about, amount, uh, what allows you to use everything else correctly, okay? Um, that implies a distinction between virtue on the one hand and the so-called indifference on the other hand, right? If you drop that, then you collapse either into cynicism, if you think that the, the indifference are not valuable at all, uh, or into Aristotelianism, if you think that virtue is good, but you also need, need, not just prefer uh, a lot of other stuff, right? So that one is, I think, one is non-negotiable. If you drop that one, you're out, or you're out of stoicism. Yeah. Uh, the second one is one that actually has happened before, even in the early stories, and that is the notion that of the three fields of, of inquiry, right? The, the logic, the physics, and the ethics. One of the things that I really like about stoicism is that it attempts to be a coherent system, a philosophical system. And it, the, the ancient stoics thought that uh, you, in order to live a good life, that's what Ethics is about, right? Ethics is about, it's, it's the study of how to live uh, your life. In order to do that, you have to have a good understanding of physics, which of course meant phusis in, in ancient Greek, that means nature. So in modern terms, how the world works. Why? Well, because if you're in the mis gross misunderstandings about how the world works, you're likely to mislive your life. You're, gonna, you're, you're acting on bad premises. And therefore, even if you reason correctly, uh, as we know in, in basic logic, if you reason correctly, but you start from bad premises, your conclusions aren't going to be that good. And then, of course, the third one is logic, by which they meant also an expanded view of the term. They meant anything that, is, that, that helps sound human reasoning. Why is that? Well, because if you have the facts right, but you don't think carefully about those facts, then you're going to, again, you, you, you're risking misliving. As you know, some of the ancient Stoics themselves actually dropped the physics and the logic, and some of the modern Stoics are trying to do the same. 
At least uh, one angel. At least one that we know of, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, and sure enough, he left the school <laughs> because if you do that, then you, again, you collapse into cynicism, uh, essentially. The cynics were not interested at all into logic and physics. They were just interested in the ethics, right? Um, so I think those are two things that are there. And then the third one that I would include in the uh, core Stoic philosophy is what, unfortunately, modern writers refer to as the dichotomy of control or the stoic fork to put it in terms of more, more, more neutral, right? I don't like the word control because as you know, that immediately raises, you know, misunderstands. Oh, but I don't control, but I influence things. Yeah, yeah, I know. Uh, <laughs> but that's not what we're talking. So meaning that there are, uh, there is a very restricted uh, uh, sense of agency, essentially. One, I think one good way of understanding that, uh, really understanding that kind of control is to say, look, your agency is far more limited than you think. Okay. You don't control any of the externals. You can influence them, but you don't control them. And in fact, you don't control even most of your mental life. Uh, the Stoics, or, or the original Stoics already were aware of it. Seneca, for instance, says, you know, you cannot avoid blushing or you cannot avoid getting upset about certain things. Even the sage cannot avoid that, right? So they knew that some part of mental life is not under your control. Today, based on modern cognitive science, we know that a lot of mental life is not under our control, more than they even thought. What is in our control? The faculty of judgment. And the reason I'm doing this, actually, is because uh, I was looking just the other day at this thing. Uh, from a modern neuroanatomical perspective, one can make a reasonable argument that the faculty of judgment, what um, the hegemonicon, what uh, Marcus Aurelius calls the ruling faculty, is essentially uh, anatomically located in the, pari in, the, in the parietal lobes. And the reason for that is because, broadly speaking, the human brain works in this way. Uh, there are, there's the frontal lobes, which are evolutionarily very recent, and those are where you, your rational thinking gets done, um, but not your decision making, your rational thinking. That's how you think logically about stuff. Then there is the amygdala at the back of the brain. That's where a lot of your emotional reactions come. Okay? And then there are the parietal lobes, and the parietal lobes literally have the job of integrating the, the input from the frontal lobes and the input from the amygdala and make you act on things. So your frontal lobes are where your prohiresis is, where your, hegemon your hegemonicon is. And that's basically who you are. And that one, I, I agree with Petitus. That's, that's, that's it. So those three things, I think, are crucial. There may be more, but at the very least, those three things, uh, I think, define stoicism at, a core, at the core. Yeah, I think that would give us uh, a good place to start um, uh, for sure. And I think those boundary questions are really difficult. Um, yeah, they are. So th thanks for um, responding to my proddings. Um, <laughs> and this has been a lot of fun. I, I really want to make sure if we get at least a few other questions. Um, and I see Scott first. Hi, Scott. Scott. Yes. Good to see you both. As um, you're going back and forth, I'm reminded of Epictetus's frequent use of Olympians and, and boxers and wrestlers. <laughs> um, so my think I've, I've been thinking a lot about fate and how it differs from destiny and providence and mostly through reading Marcus Aurelius, but I'm really fascinated by the way you guys are unpacking Epictetus. So I just want to share a perspective and then have you guys tear it apart. <laughs> I think of providence as being in charge of destiny, what's going to happen. And I, my guess is my reading is that the Stoics say that things are unfolding as they are, are, are they as they are intended to unfold, and so destiny is what's going to happen. Fate is what has happened, what just happened, and that idea of embracing fate, amor fati, is a way that we can be a part of a continuum that is unfolding as it will. We can't know what destiny holds for us. We can take what fate has dealt us and we can deal with that with equanimity and be intentional and have integrity about the way that we um, approach or accept what happens and then what we decide to do next. And again, stepping into that with intention and integrity. So for me, it's a, the idea that we're not just letting life happen to us we accept we are embracing the idea that life is happening through us and since we cannot know what fate or what destiny has in store 
we must do what we are born to do, which is to live in accord with nature, to enhance our character and our virtue, and to do what is good for for those that we find ourselves with. Um, so just interested to get your perspective from uh, Epictetus or the Stoics in general on that kind of interpretation. Rob, go for it. I, okay, I'll take it. I can see you poised there. <laughs> yeah, a little bit. <laughs> um, I think, Scott, that, that I might, uh, on behalf of the Stoics, have some terminological differences. Uh, but I'm not sure there would be a, a, a deeper difference. Um, what I would want to say is that fate is just the whole sequence of causes. Okay. Going back all the way, but also going all, forward all the way. But I would want to emphasize by that, that I and my choices are part of that sequence of causes. I'm not something other from that, right? That I'm being bombarded with, right? Right. Fate works through my choices as well as through everyone else's choices, right? Um, so I'm not separate from. So on the sort of reading I was pushing today with Massimo and, and um, uh, one part of that, trying to remain neutral about, about uh, is at least is that providence is, is that plan, is that way that things work out. So they aren't really two different things. Now we can talk about them, right? In terms of what's going forward that I can't know, you're quite right about that. And what's come about that I can, and that I must at least accept, if not uh, embrace um, somewhere in that range. I would say these are the um, these are the uh, that's that's what I think is going on, and yeah. I think I think that's consistent with what you said, except maybe not terminological. I, I would just add one more uh, thing because you you just reminded me, Rob, about when you said absolutely correctly that for the Stoics, uh, fate or you know cause and effect or whatever works through us. We're we're part of, part and parcel of the system. It's not like we're separate. And that to me is a good way to understand why the Stoics in modern terminology were compatibilists about free will, right? Because the other two uh, kinds of positions often make it sound one explicitly and they want the other one somewhat um, more problematically, make it sound like we are actually somehow outside or, or, or separate. Like the, the, the counter, um, the, the, the free will, the notion of free will that is counter uh, causal, you know, the ones that is ex usually put forth by Christian theologians, that one literally asks you to believe that human beings are outside of, you know, somehow we can, we can transcend cause and effect and that, that our decisions are our decisions in a way that is completely detached from the rest. But even when you, when you hear some hard compatibilists talking about things like, you know, Sam Harris, for instance, he often uses this analogy of, oh, well, we, we're just puppets in the, you know, move the, the strings of which are moved by the universe. That's a bad analogy. I don't know if that's really what he means, but if it is what he means, it's a bad analogy, precisely for the reason that, that um, Rob just brought up, brought up. The puppet moved by the strings make it look like you're a passive recipient of the forces of the universe. We are not a passive recipient of the forces of the universe. We are part of the forces of the universe, a small one, for sure. But nevertheless, uh, you know, we are co as as Chrisipo would put it, we are co causes of what happens, right? And so it isn't a question of just accepting passively what happens to us. It's a question of actually realizing that we are we have a role to play. Um, this is why the Stoics were big about uh, the uh, so-called um, uh, what's it called the um, not the lazy argument, but something like that. Um, when when they was that is that the term the lazy argument, right? Uh, when people were saying so, Chrysippus at some point says, "Look, if you are sick, um, part of and you can't say, oh, well, if it's faded that I get better, I'll get better regardless of whether I go to the doctor or not, because you're fated to get better, but that." goes through you getting up and going to the doctor and taking the medicine. If you don't do that sort of stuff, then you're not going to get better. Uh, and you know, you are a cause of these things. You, you can't just lie there and wait for, for, for things to happen. That is the lazy argument. That's like, yeah. you know, you can't, you can't do that. All right. Next we got Bob. Hey, yeah. Thanks. Thanks guys. I really enjoyed the conversation and, uh, 
for everyone in here that participates on Facebook groups, I really love interacting with everyone that does that. So shout out to everyone there. Um, I think this, I think this piggybacks off of, uh, off of Scott's question and it has to do with free will and determinism and stoic thought. And, uh, I was reflecting on Bill Irvine's book, uh, and he suggests that the stoic is only deterministic to the past and the immediate present moment. And I, I guess my question is, and, and oh, and he also says that we can still influence the future. So I guess my question is, is this an accurate interpretation of stoic determinism in your, in your, in stoic practice? Because if that's, he, he really eloquently put, and I was just acting if that, I was just asking if you think that would be accurate. Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, Rob, again, I'll, I'm going to leave you uh, to do the first pass. Okay. Uh, if you don't lucky mind. Lucky me. <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh, um, I actually think that's not accurate about the Stoic view. Okay. Uh, I think Irvine's view is interesting, um, but I think it's um, mistaken in the following way. And I think it actually does piggyback with what we were just saying about, um, you know, in response to Scott, is that, um, we are already part of the causal story. Now, um, our choices are part of, if you like, the web of cause and effect. So, of course, I influence this in a certain way, right, by being a part of the causal story, right? Now, determinism here seems to be it's possible to use determinism here in two different senses. One is in sort of a metaphysical sense, right? Which is this whole string of causes, right? Um, you know, a sequence of causes is the language uh, that they typically attribute to Chrysippus, for example. And Chrysippus' theory of causality is, is complex and difficult and so on, but it goes on. But there's also the question of whether we know what's going on. And that's an epistemological question, which differs, right? So it's possible to be a complete determinist at the metaphysical level, which I think the Stoics are, right? And be perfectly happy with the idea that I don't know what's going to happen after the present moment, which I think is implied uh, by lots of things that the Stoics say. So to say they're not determinists because we don't know what's going to happen is not to address the metaphysical determinism. And so that's why I think that's kind of a conflation or a, a misunderstanding of the two things. I hope that yeah. makes some sense. See, that's, that's why I, I, I let Rob going first, because he explains things much better than I do. <laughs> um, no, I think you're absolutely right. There is, there is often a confusion, uh, or at least we should try not to make a confusion between the metaphysical claim and the epistem epistemological claim. Uh, yes, and the two are not incompatible, as you just, as you just said. I, I obviously don't know what the future is going, uh, you know, it has in store for me. Um, and in fact, I don't even know a lot of the past because I cannot reach a lot of the past, uh, epistem epistemically speaking. But nevertheless, that doesn't mean that the past is not fixed. Um, and for the Stoics, right. the, definitely the whole thing is deterministic. That's why, in fact, they're, in a sense, they're even more deterministic than modern, most modern scientists are, are, are comfortable with because the Stoics believed in this um, complete cycle you know, cycling of the entire, you know, every, everything that happens in the universe cycles over and over in exactly the same manner. The universe, uh, it, you know, uh, originates with this, this big fire, then, then it ends with a big fire, and then it starts again, and it does it exactly in the same way, which means that this conversation with you guys has happened infinite number of times and will happen in the future infinite number of times, right? Modern, my take on my understanding of modern physics is that a lot of modern physicists don't go that far, although that, interestingly, the cyclical universe was a model in cosmology that was proposed in the 1950s and 60s. But because of quantum mechanics, and because of the, the notion that universes start out with a singularity, with a, with a quantum mechanical singularity, which therefore is essentially an unpredictable event, intrinsically unpredictable event, then each universe or each cycle uh, will actually go on its own, on its own and it's, then it's, there isn't going to be a, a repeat, an exact repetition of, of things. So the ancient studies were even more deterministic, I think, than, than modern physics uh, would allow. But from the point of view of uh, both practical philosophy as practiced by the Stoics and uh, as, as, as we are practicing today, I think that we should be concerned with the epistemic claim. 
And that's where the lazy argument comes in, right? Because of course the lazy argument, metaphysically speaking, the lazy argument says, sure, you do whatever you do, you're gonna do whatever you're gonna do. And, and um, you know, that's not gonna change. The, the laws of physics have already determined that you're gonna do what you're gonna do. Whether you're gonna get up for the, and go to the doctor and get cured or not, stay in bed and not. Um, but epistemically, you don't know that. Epistemically, you have no idea how things are going to unfold. So because you don't know, it stands to reason that you get up and go to the doctor and take the medicine and, and then hope for the best. Uh, yes, whatever is going to happen at the end was already fated, so to speak. Uh, but since you don't know it, you have to do your best. Yeah, you have to act according to your uh, best judgment, right? Um, I, yes, go ahead, Rob. No, no, I was just going to see if there were any more questions. We could maybe do one more if... Yeah, we have enough time for one more if there is any, any question. I don't see any hands raised in the, in the chat. Did you have any lingering thoughts about uh, the field guide to, to a happy life? Well, of course I do, but they're probably days <laughs> worth. So um, <laughs> I'll hold on to them for now. <laughs> Sounds good. Yeah. All right, well, well then uh, uh, we are done for today. Thanks everyone for, uh, for coming. And uh, as I said, I'm going to look up my, my notes. The next episode of these uh, informal conversations about stoicism with uh, Rob and I will take place on October 25th, 1 p.m. Eastern time. And it will feature William Stevens, author of Marcus Aurelius, A Guide for the Perplexed. Thanks very much for coming. I hope you enjoyed it and you learned something. We all, I certainly learned something from Rob every time. And uh, stay safe. Thank you. <laughs>